Hey everybody, welcome back to Half Ass. As always, I'm sitting here with Andrew. Today we're going to talk about the MP7 you have at home. Or chasing the MP7 or whatever else. Or guns you can't have but want, but maybe can have, but maybe not. But also cannot afford because, my God. But anyway, just because it exists on Gunbroker doesn't mean it's real. Yeah, that's true. So, this video was originally going to be titled something to the effect of the MP7 you have at home. But when we came up with the idea about four days later, Brandon Herrera posted his video of the exact same gun, just in an A1 version. Great and minds think alike. Yeah, I mean, at least we're on the right track. But before we dive into all that, we have our giveaway going on. It is a new giveaway with a 10,000 sub goal. We are giving away a M17 surplus, one of the original 4,000 pistols that were used for military trials with SIG. It is a heirloom collectible for military and gun owners alike. So all you got to do, like, follow, comment, subscribe. Subscribe is the most important what the competition is based off of. Um, but we also have a winner for the 500 rounds of 9mm. So we're going to put that right here. Congratulations on your winnings. And we will, uh, I need you to reach out to us, info at BuckeyeShootingCenter.com. That way we can get you age verified, all that fun stuff. We'll send the ammo to you. But now we're going to dive into some fun stuff. So why don't you take us into what the hell we're talking about? So there are guns that exist in the world that everyone wishes they could have, but they are so incredibly hard to find. I think you can probably count on one hand the number of real transferable MP7s that exist in America. and Well, at least in the open market. I'm sure the Secret Service has a ton of them. And you can also probably count to a very easy to count to number how many semi-auto civilian variants of MP7s are floating around out there. So the MP7 is a super iconic gun that everybody loves, so much so that people have designed other firearms that are close to it or clones of it or copies of it. And we have a couple examples here from some of our resident MP7 nerds here at the shop. We have a... Uh, a flux which we kind of group into that category of the mp7 and then we also have the uh the ferrotech kit for the cp33 which is a little bit more of a look-alike but a little bit lower caliber so yeah so the ft7 from ferrotech is what got this thing started my gun and it's sweet uh so keltec no no shade thrown to them i'm not even going to get into their guns uh, but I had a CP33 laying around for a long time with a little side folding brace on it because I was trying to make it look like an MP7. Yeah. And then discovered Ferrotech did this FT7 clone uh, chassis that you can just drop in this. And it's, from experience, it's not the easiest thing to put together, but it's not difficult if you have any semblance of mechanical knowledge of how things work. But it's SLS printed, so not 3D printed, which is a big difference. So rigidity is there. I actually think the chassis is a better built chassis than the polymer the gun's made out of. Uh, but it is a full MP7A2 clone to include even the extended mag plates and everything else. Uh, a lot of fun to shoot. Chambered a 20 long rifle. Uh, but yeah, everybody for the longest time has been chasing that FT7 or the FT7, the MP7 itch. So much so that Palmetto's supposedly coming out with their clone of the MP7. Uh, BNT does the TP9, which is probably the closest thing you can get to a, a real regular cartridge or a pistol cartridge MP7 looking clone. Yeah, the TP9 is sweet. They're sweet and they're 9mm. They're also very expensive, but available. But what are, the, what are the, all these based off of originally? The Uzi. Yeah, it was all kind of a crapshoot to try to get away from the Uzi and get into a more modern platform that was armor piercing and or had some armor defeating capability. I look at these things, uh I look at the Uzi as like the original M sixteen. Of like the A one of, of the submachine gun of, pistol. Of specifically these because like the magazine loads through the grip. Yeah. And then you look at the MP seven of the the Cadillac of them. And it there's it might not be the best. I've never even shot an MP seven because they're that rare. They just look cool, and they're in every video game I've ever played. So I just want one. Same th same reason I want a G36, too. Another gun that you can't get. H and carry, Jesus Christ, you want to stop losing money all over the place? Sell MP7s and G36s to the consumer public. 
Jesus, even 922R compliant model. I know if, if HK would just give the people what they want, they probably would be so much more successful as a, of a company. Stop giving me another fucking VP9. I know. God, how many VP9s do we need? Or all, all this 922R compliance G36 MP7. Same thing. I wish you could go back in time and scream at Colt. Like, you want to not go bankrupt? Make snake guns again. Yeah, or make the or also make the SP5 cheaper. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. They 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 put a premium on their name. So, uh, we did some stuff in the range. We had a lot of fun. Andrew shooting most of this stuff because he is yet to learn how to use the cameras the right way. So I get to be the cameraman behind the scenes, and he gets to be the uh, the talent on screen. But went through went through very basic functionality these things. Shot some stuff, and then uh, a little fun treat at the end of shooting a plate. Well, soft armor. Yeah, some soft armor. What the MP7 was designed to be able to kind of defeat and stuff like that. Yeah, because MP7 factory gun chambered at 4.6 and inherently has armor feeding, armor defeating capabilities just yeah. based on the ballistics and the, it, the the cartridge. It does really well with that that simple light armor. Yeah, it definitely stopped a 22, but the 9 mil was fun. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're going to take you guys to the range real fast. It shouldn't take too long. We'll get you back over here. Hey guys, thanks for joining us at the range today for Guns You Can't Have. So we have a couple interesting ones for you guys today as the theme of the day is the MP7. Now, everybody loves the MP7, it's an iconic gun. There are a couple just as goods or pretty closes that people have come up with over the years in our opinion. We have a couple we're gonna try out. This one is the Flux Raider. This is a really popular one that we see. One of the really cool reasons that people jump on these is because everybody out there has a P320. You can go ahead and slap all the parts and pieces into one. You can customize these however you want. You see we have like the charging handle swap for the front sight. We have a cool comp on there running a Trigicon up on the mount. Now, just like an MP7, we do have a brace and we have a some type of way to hold onto the front, but this is not a grip. This is actually our extra magazine. So we're gonna do a couple shots with this. We're gonna see, is it like an MP7? Can we do some drills? How's it gonna run? So let's uh, play with the coolest feature first. Ooh, there we go. All right, let's see how she runs. Very quick, very fat, very little recoil, especially with that comp. A little weird on that one. We gotta get another reload. That was bad. Now the MP7 is a sweet, iconic gun because it's something super tiny that you can wear up underneath a suit jacket, have in a tiny little bag, deploy rapidly, and just really mess stuff up with. Now the Flux is a really sweet example of that, and it's really cool because it's a common platform that just about everybody already has access to. So this is a really cool way to kind of bring what you wish you had into what you already have and kind of come up with a little mix. A little bit unique in terms of the manual of arms, but a little but the extra switches, they won't scare you too much when you get used to them. Now, for those of you who care more about the visual aesthetics of the MP7 and you want something that looks as close to, maybe not the same function of as we were approaching with the Flux, we have the Ferrotech, okay? Now, this is a chassis that drops on your kel CP33. And right here, we can see we're very close to that MP7A2 look. We have the optic height right where it needs to be. Nice streamlined system, except we're chambered in 22. So we can take this to the range. We can play with it all day long and live out all of our MP7 fantasies. Let's have some fun.
Ooh, safety. Ooh. Of course, no recoil. Uh, don't even need ear protection with the suppressor on there. Let's uh, let's see if we can get it running a little quicker. So one of the reasons the MP7 was made was to be able to penetrate armor. So downrange, we have a level three soft armor plate, very indicative of something someone would wear under a suit or something in public. We're gonna start out with the 22, then we're gonna move up to the nine and we're gonna see, do either of these just as good MP7s live up to that expectation? All right, a few rounds of 22, let's go check it out. All right, we hit it with a little bit out of a mag of 22. Let's see if we had any penetration here. No, nope, no penetration. You can feel everything kind of all bunched up in there. It didn't like it, but it held up. So let's move on to the nine mil and I'll be surprised if it's still sitting there after a couple shots of nine. All uh, right, moving up to the Flux. Doesn't look as much like an MP7 as the Ferrotech, but it's a little bit more practical. Let's see how it does against this armor. Well, I think one will do it. <laughs> so as we see here, it's gone. <laughs> so if your chest was back there, it probably wouldn't feel good. Let's go see if it went through. Oh my God. So it did actually stop the bullet. It tore everything apart. This is some really, really cheap armor. Um, however, the deformation we're seeing here is so bad. I mean, you'd probably survive this, but your ribs would be broken. It would hurt a lot, so. Uh, better than nothing, but not quite MP7. All right, so as you saw, we have a lot of fun with these things. The fun part about guns like this is they're cheap to shoot. They're relatively cost-effective when it comes to it because we use... So this is our warehouse guy, Tony's gun, the Flux. This is my FT7. We took guns we already had and then found some chassis and some stuff to make them a little bit more fun and yeah. fun to play with. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. The Command Arms Roni kits for Glocks. Where a Glock oh, just yeah. lights up in the chassis, give you a, a similar feel to things like this. There's tons of options out there that you can play around with. But at the end of the day, you don't have to break the bank. You can take something that you already have. Find, there's tons of aftermarket stuff out there for them. And then kind of plug and play. It's Legos for adults, dude. Just build it's, them piece together. Especially with the explosion of printing becoming a thing in the gun industry. There's so many people out there that are making so many cool chassis systems, yep. so many cool parts especially like this Keltec over here, that chassis, it's it's mostly for looks. It doesn't really do many practical things. It does change some of the switches and buttons around a little bit, but for the most part, it's just for looks and it, it functions really well and it yeah. does what it needs to do. So one of the fun things that I'm starting to learn a little bit more about too, uh, my son got into 3D printing and stuff, is they're not all created equal by any stretch. So when you hear something's been printed, don't don't stick your nose up at it because some of the best cans being produced right now, suppressors, are 3D printed titanium. Sure. I mean, I, the one I can think of is the Mojave from Dead. A lot of the SIGs are too, some of the newer SIGs. So not all printing is created equal. It's just a manufacturing process. This is SLS printed, which is nowhere near what regular 3D printing is. Uh, it's rigid. It's rigid as hell. It's reinforced. <laughs> Excuse me. And like I said, it, it's got a better feel and quality than the damn gun itself does but you can take something old and make it something new really inexpensively and have a lot of fun with it that's probably my favorite part about the flux is how many guys have a 320 just sitting around you know it's very easy or maybe you had a 320 that you've already customized and you have a bunch of extra parts laying around 
So you could take that old 320, you could take those extra parts, you can buy a chassis like this, and then you could build it up into a cool little backpack gun, cool little, you know, SHTF, like rapid deployment, little hide under the coat jacket yeah. kind of gun. And again, for all the nerds at home, they're like, ah, 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 this is an SBR. Yeah. This is a brace. Yes. This is not a foregrip. So we're, this is riding a line. This is a two stamp gun. So, yeah. Uh, don't ask why. I went through the free stamp extravaganza. I was like, why not? Why not? So, a lot of fun to play around with. A lot of affordability there. All in on this gun. If you take away the suppressor and the optic, it's like 800 bucks all in between the chassis. And probably even less than that. And you can do braces with those, right? Yes, they have them for a brace model. I had already SBR'd the CP33, so I could bypass that and just go to the stock. Um, already had the can. Had an extra tubular Hollison laying around. So it worked out really well, but got on the chassis subs eight hundred bucks. I know the fluxes are like three or four hundred bucks. It's the sky's the limit with the fluxes because three twenties range anywhere from a few hundred dollars all the way up to a few thousand dollars. So if you want to start from scratch with one, it, you just use the fire control group and the slide. Yeah. So you can even get an FCU and a slide from like Dermo probably at this point. Mm -hmm. But they work great. And then, of course, with like the BNT TP9, you know, BNT stands for bust out a few more thousand. So you could get into a TP9 for a few grand, especially if you wanted to get the whole kit like that. It would be a couple thousand dollars at least, but also a really, really cool gun. I mean, heck, you could even do a throwback and go for an old school Uzi or something like that mm -hmm. if you wanted that at hand in hand, little submachine pistol style gun. Yeah. I mean, they're sky's the limit. Nice thing is they're fun. They're, they're fun to shoot. They're fun to plank around with. But you can't get an MP7 unless well, you, you essentially win the lottery. Yeah. There there are options, but I don't even know what the, the population is on them. I think it's less than 100 that are actually transferable in the United States. I think it's way less. I, I overshot intentionally. <laughs> Somebody's going to correct us on it, I'm sure. But one of my favorite guns out there, it's a Hollywood gun. It serves me no purpose at all, but I just like it. And that's okay. You can own guns just because you like them. Yeah. But that's a good point. It's not all guns have to be practical. Sometimes the use case can be fun. fun. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which, yeah, I mean, this was a quick video. It was just something to throw together to show you that you can take something that you may have laying around doing nothing. There's tons of stuff out there now. Chassis for everything. I know they make runny kits uh, for Glock, Smith, Beretta, even Taurus now, oh, I think Canik. Let, let's not even get into bullpup kits. Oh god, no, 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 no. The the bullpups uh, score. Uh, no, what was it? The bullpup no, strybog. Be in one too. The strybog. Yeah, yeah. The bullbog. That's what it was called. Yeah, yeah. JTAC bullbog. Like they even have chassis kits out there. I think it's High Tower Armory does them for um, High Point carbines, and they make them look like the Beretta CX carbines. And they actually work pretty well. We had one of our regulars donate one last year for our, our charity giveaway that we did. And I was surprised at how, how well it actually felt and shot. It was pretty cool. What I love is when you actually see this stuff being used in practical situations. So, like, I know in the Ukraine war right now, you're seeing guys running around all over the place with those AKs that have had the bullpup conversion done to them so they can more effectively CQB with like old school, like 1960s and 70s AKs. And that's essentially exactly what we've done here. They've taken all sorts of crazy antique guns. And I mean, they've taken old school, like vehicle mounted belt fed machine guns and they've taken them to these machine shops and added grips Take them to the chop shop. You take, take him to the chop shop and make it man portable, even though this was supposed to be mounted on a vehicle. <laughs> like, yeah. And it's, I mean, there is some situations where things like this are practical. This is what we're doing here, though, is just for fun. Yeah, this is 100% for fun. I mean, I know Tony shoots this thing in leagues, and this thing I just finished building, and every time I go out there, I come back from the range with a smile on my face because shooting a suppressed twenty two like this is just fun. Yeah. But, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. It's just one of those days, man. This is so loosely done today that... It's all up here, man. This, this is one of those videos where, like, you want to do a video? Yeah. Well, the range is dry or, you know, dead right now. Let's go in the range and shoot. 
So we went and shot, and then we're throwing shit together. Let's just talk about some fun stuff. The throw shit at the wall, see what sticks. This was on the docket, but it kind of got all blown out the window when uh, Herrera posted his video a week or two ago. Yeah, it would feel a little pointless to do a comprehensive yeah. Ferrotech in depth. When, yeah, I'll tag his video in here. Uh, we were already we were already so far behind. If you want to see the Ferrotech FT7 in a pretty comprehensive review, Brandon Herrera did one, and it's it's really well done. He did one in an A1. This is an A2, uh, but I'll tag the video here somewhere on the screen. And uh, you can check it out. But he goes over manual of arms, operations, stuff like that. Now, I will say his his chassis kit was a little different and a little older. He experienced an issue with uh, the stock on his, with it cracking. And since then, they had made a, an adjustment to the manufacturing process and changed it. So mine has the reinforced steel bar inside of it that his does not. So I will not have that problem, knock on wood. Um, Is this wood? Eh, laminate. Yeah that that he did but all in all it's pretty much a screw for screw copy except his is an a1 and mine's an a2 and the only reason i did an a2 call of duty modern warfare <laughs> i mean yeah yeah you got anything else to add to this shit show for today no that's it all right guys um don't forget we have our giveaway going on giving away that m17 surplus to one lucky subscriber when we hit 10,000 subs Congratulations to our winner of the ammunition. Please reach out. That way we can do our age verification stuff and send that over to you uh, and once we verify that you are indeed who you say you are. But you have anything else? Nope, that's all I got. All right, guys. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us ramble today. I know it was a shit show, uh, or half ass anyway. We're living up to the name this week. Next week's video is going to be a lot of fun, so stay tuned. We appreciate the support. We'll catch you next time.